Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Megan Wood with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenters. Dr. James Lynch is a board-certified spinal neurosurgeon with 25 years of experience. He specializes in complex spine surgery, cervical disorders, degenerative spine, spinal deformities, trauma, tumor infection, and minimally invasive spine surgery. Dr. Lynch has been performing minimally invasive spine surgery techniques since 2002. Dr. Lynch performs over 500 spine surgeries per year in both hospital and outpatient center settings. Dr. Lynch is one of the handful of spine surgeons with three fellowships in the specialty of spine surgery. He has been a consultant neurosurgeon in the Reno area since 2000 after completing his, completing his neurosurgery residency at Mayo Clinic and spine fellowships at Queen Square in London and Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix. He has also served as chief of neurosurgery at St. Mary's Hospital. Dr. Lynch serves as a partner and director of spine services at Regent Surgical Health, a company involved in developing hospitals and ASC outpatient surgery centers. He has been published in leading journals, including Spine Journal of Neurosurgery and Neurosurgery. As a leading authority on ambulatory surgery center development, Dr. Lynch lectures at national meetings on outpatient spine surgery and minimally invasive spine surgery. Dr. Douglas Smith received his medical training at Wake Forest University Medical Center before doing orthopedic surgery residency training in orthopedic biomechanics for three years at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Smith then pursued a radiology res residency training at Mellencrat Institute at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, where he served as a single chief resident. He was called to active duty for the Gulf War as a major in the United States Air Force, serving at Wilford Hall Medical Center. He served as the chief of the radiology residency program, chief of emergency radiology, chief of outpatient radiology, and chief of orthopedic radiology, receiving spe special commendation for revising radiology and orthopedic workflow co collaboration systems while involved in military use of telemedicine, including initial use of radiology image transmission using secure satellite transmission support of Gulf War military theater. Dr. Smith is an American Board of Preventive Medicine board certified clinical informatist and holds 10 USPTO patents pending in the areas of interoperability, medical informatics, and medical te collaboration technologies. He's a serial doctorpreneur, inventor, medical software designer, thought leader, and advocate of meaningful collaboration, and is the CEO of Celebrio MRI Diagnostic Imaging. Nancy Richardson combined her industry and client passion with her career experience in engineering, corporate business research, and product and services marketization and launch to create her own business, VOC Company, LLC. VOC stands for Voice of Customer, though she researches, plans, positions, and launches companies or products and or services of a company based on the voice of the client, industry, sales, and leadership. Her career uniquely launched in the technology world by way of specializing in radar and navigational systems of fighter jets while serving our country in the U.S. Air Force. This experience also opened Nancy to many cultures, having lived abroad and worked with and visited over 25 countries. During her career in IT, she continued her education to achieve her Master's of Science, while also engaging with vertical markets by way of being positioned in industry boards and communities focused on collaborative and process improvement initiatives. As the U.S. government launched their new health insurance approach in 2009, she conceived, launched, and hosted Healthcare from the Hill Live, a weekly national broadcast featuring a range of key lobbyists and guests from Washington, D.C., recorded and distributed through 2011. She looks forward to hosting our audience and today's guests. Nancy, I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Megan, and welcome, everyone. Welcome, Dr. Lynch and Dr. Smith. Thank you. And welcome, everybody who and audience members. Uh, we really appreciate your participation. I think you're going to be in for an exciting insight into the innovation of weight-bearing technology, especially focused on uh, the spine as a specialty. Today we have the agenda as follows, and we'll be working very interactively today. So uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Lynch uh, have worked together to be able to present some real great insight into their expertise and experience, and transferring some lessons learned and insight into the technology of weight-bearing MRI. 
Uh, we'll go into a little history about the evolution into weight-bearing MRIs, how it really affects the diagnosing approach and in treating uh, both the cervical, cervical and lumbar issues, as well as uh, the insight from a business standpoint, meeting minimum criteria in healthcare guidelines. We'll also at the end, as Megan referenced, have a 15-minute Q&A session. I encourage everybody throughout the call as you think of questions. Please go ahead and submit them. We're queuing them up for the end of the call, and we'll be addressing them live time. So first, we're going to go into weight-bearing MRI innovation. And uh, there's quite a history, and, and Dr. Smith actually has some great insight into the history of the spinal imaging transition from some years ago to today's evolution. Dr. Smith, this is, it looks like Thank a very so great slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody, and welcome. Um, I wanted to set the level set for those who uh, have, have not seen this whole um, evolution in spinal imaging. But going back to the 1970s, uh, there's there's been an interest in uh, determining why do people hurt when they stand up and feel better when they lay down and and what is it mechanically that happens when uh, it, when the spine is uh, subjected to a stress and in the 70s we had panopaque myelography which is this oily uh, fluid that you put into the um, sac of fluid or the thecal sac and then you took pictures and then you tried to get it back out again and there were a lot of complications with it. it was a very painful procedure and in the late 70s CT uh, came out or computed tomography and we were able to see the nerve root elements and the discs and things like that but not with a great deal of resolution uh, because uh, it, uh, you couldn't see them as well as in the myelograms. And in 1983, the first MRI came out, and it was exciting, especially in the area of uh, brain and neural imaging. We could finally see these, um, see the brain without doing uh, painful and complicating procedures. <laughs> and um, I entered uh, uh, orthopedic residency training in. Uh, 1984, so it was the third MRI in the US. And at that time, we thought MRI would change everything, that there'd no longer be any more myelography and there wouldn't be CT and MR would be able to show us everything. Um, during the course of the 80s, uh, we did a fair amount of research and determined that we were no longer able to see what we could see in myelograms, which is when people are standing up, they compressed their nerve roots, and when they laid down, it got better. So in the 1990s, myelography uh, returned along with CT. Unfortunately, by that time, most of the radiologists had forgotten how to do the standing views that showed the images during weight bearing. And along came discography. And discography is insertion of a needle into the disc. You pressurize it just like you would pressurize a tire and uh, overinflate it and, and see if it reproduces the symptoms. So it's a way to try to reproduce what people are experiencing when they're standing up. In the late 1990s, the first weight-bearing MRI came out, which was uh, Phonar. It was initially met in 2000 to 2003 in the um, academic community in UCLA with research that showed weight bearing showed about 30% uh, of findings that were missed while lying down or were more significant. Initially, there was really excitement about that until uh, the insurance companies responded back and said, whoa, 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 <laughs> not sure we're on to that and called it uh, experimental. Research uh, confirmed that finding about 30 to 40 percent more findings throughout the 2000s, but there became uh, some uh, dispute uh, about payment and, and what surgeries were necessary based on these increased findings. We're going to talk later about the Milliman criteria and how that fit in, but in the late 2000, I think about 2008, the Asote G-Scan or tiltable MR uh, became available in Europe. And it um, came to the U.S. in 2013, 
And uh, we're going to talk today about how that has changed the approach of bringing the mechanics back into uh, spinal imaging. Now, one of the questions that comes up is, uh, in the past two decades, there's been a push to higher and higher field strength of magnets, and, and that's me uh, measured as Tesla, kind of like the car. Uh, and the general sense is that if you need uh, rapid imaging or if you're imaging in the brain where the, they're mostly qualitative uh, differences, then uh, the higher field strength is optimal. However, in the spine, it's more mechanical issue. And here we have pictures. The first ones were shown were sagittal views looking from the side at three Tesla, 1.5 Tesla, and 0.25 Tesla, like the G scanner. This, this, this slide shows the axial images. And when I'm giving lectures, I put these up and ask people without the labels on them, show me the difference. And for the most part, what's happened in the past 15 years is Asote has done a superb job with the imaging receiver coil technology. So you can get much better pictures at a much lower field strength. And the lower field strength is required mechanically to get these upright images. So in essence, we get both the laying down images and the upright images, and we have all the signal that we need to do that. Now, now why is that important? Well, this, this slide shows uh, essentially the context of a stress test MRI. We're all familiar with doing an EKG that really doesn't show the coronary disease because the person's not under exertion. And that we do a stress test um, EKG to bring out that coronary disease. The same thing's true in the spine. We scan somebody lying down, we put them up in the position where they hurt, and we look for those changes between those two positions to explain why do they hurt when they're standing up and feel better when they're laying down. Um, let me just show you a little video of, uh, it's about 30 seconds, but it'll show you a little bit about the mechanics of the scanner and what we're looking for. And then I'll come back and show you a couple cases for it. So this just shows the, uh, the scanner being tilted up into weight bearing position. The collar piece is the receiver coil that gives us great images. And as you can see, when we put weight bearing and flex or extend, you get a dynamic disc herniation and dynamic uh, compression of the spinal cord, which was yellow there. You also uh, clinically may see a radiculopathy or um, uh, myelopathy or symptoms along the course of those compressed nerve roots. So here's an MRI exam from the side. On the left is laying down. On the right is uh, upright with uh, cervical flexion. In the middle, you see kind of a diagram grammatic representation of uh, the vertebral bodies as stacked blocks, blocks. And what it's showing here is there's a dynamic uh, disc herniation or dynamic cord compression. On the right, there's flattening of the cord that I had seen for years on the laying down images, but I, I, I couldn't prove that that's what was doing it. Now we routinely see uh, in weight bearing and flexion, you see a dynamic uh, disc herniation, that it may explain the uh, myelopathic symptoms that Jim will talk about. Now, here's what I'm talking about in axial images. Above to the left, upper left, is a uh, axial view or a cross-sectional view of uh, the cervical spine. The uh, white is the fluid around the uh, spinal cord, and you see the cord that should be a smooth oval is flattened in the front. I'd seen that for years, and I say, gosh, it looks like something is probably compressing that. Well, if you look at the image on the right, you'll see same patient uh, sitting up in flexion, and you'll see there's a dynamic disc herniation. It gets bigger when you compress the disc, and essentially what we're doing with upright and flexion is the equivalency of a discogram. We're compressing that disc, putting it under greater pressure, and uh, that's where that dynamic uh, cord compression comes from. This just shows the still of what you saw in the video. The 
orange lines that go down the hand are the nerve root distribution. In this particular case, we're showing the dynamic disc herniation on the right with cord compression, and that represents uh, myelopathic symptoms. So I did pain management for about 15 years, and I would encounter people with these positional uh, neurologic symptoms for which there wasn't a great explanation on conventional uh, supine imaging, and now we routinely are able to explain the uh, neurologic or radicular symptoms that Dr. Lynch will talk about uh, later. So a question um, for you. <laughs> so how has weight bearing really impacted your current state of how you really work with your local environment and community? with weight-bearing technology and introducing that into that area versus the typical traditional supine approach? Well, I think it's confirmed um, what I have experienced uh, in training and, um, you know, in 30 years worth of experience is that um, the spine is a dynamic uh, structure. It changes in shape uh, when you're uh, upright and also during activities and our we spent the past 30 years trying to figure out how to display what patients have been telling us for years and my my training starting in orthopedics and then pain management for about 15 years and now uh, working heavily with weight bearing has really brought together the pain management surgery and imaging um, uh, channels, if you will, in that we all have the same goal. We want to explain why patients hurt when they're when they're uh, in activity or standing up, and why we why they get better when they lay down. So I think of it as a uh, if I had three T a three Tesla supine image, and I had a really high resolution um, picture of a falsely negative test, that doesn't help me. Uh, I still haven't explained why the patient has their pain, but if we put them upright and flex them and we compare that with a pain diagram on each patient, then we can correlate the neurologic compression with the distribution of symptoms, which is really one of the basis for the Milliman criteria, which leads into your next question. Exactly. Well, and, and that really, and thank you very much, Dr. Smith, that was very insightful because you're introducing that technology, and I understand of, of this technology, it's so innovative that there's, there's maybe a, a handful across the country at this point, and it's just starting to hit, hit the market with some reality and understanding exactly what you just said and how it impacts the patients as well as the surgeons, which brings us to how you and Dr. Lynch met. So I understand, actually, it's courtesy of a Becker Spine Review article that you posted, and, um, and Dr. Lynch is on the phone as well. And I was just thought it would be a great question to understand how you two met and what came out of that, that meeting. I'll, I'll probably take the lead on that, so Doug, uh, seems I made the first contact. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this uh, Becker's webinar um, uh, today. But um, I first uh, got in contact with Doug after reading some articles that he presented uh, in actually April 2013, so over four years ago now. He discussed uh, Milliman criteria uh, with spine imaging in, in general, uh, which was exciting, and also he addressed um, basically incorporating weight-bearing MRI into a spine practice, which certainly was exciting for me as a, a, a neurosurgeon. At the time, uh, you know, fast-paced uh, practice and uh, trying to keep up on things, Becker was the leading light uh, for sure uh, when it came to advanced practice development and, and has continued to do so and has strengthened it, uh, its uh, authority over the last four years. And it's, it's read and, and uh, seen by many both uh, on uh, social media and the, the, the website and the, uh, the literature they produce. Uh, this was attractive to me, and I saw this article about the, uh, the uh, uh, weight-bearing MRI in the spine practice. I read the article, and it basically showed several of the advantages that Doug has uh, alluded to on the cervical spine and what we'll talk about in the lumbar. And uh, it certainly got my attention. Uh, I reached out to Scott Becker, and he put me in contact immediately with uh, Doug, and we, we began a conversation over the phone, and Doug invited me down to 
uh, uh, San Antonio to visit his practice as a radiologist and see the technology really firsthand, um, which you know basically sold me on the technology that this was something that uh, we could readily incorporate into Spine Nevada as really a truly differentiating uh, component to our um, growing practice, and uh, it has to to this day. Excellent, excellent. Now, what I was curious about myself is in, in the draw of the Milliman care guidelines themselves, obviously that I understand from our conversation that we've had in the past and from Dr. Smith, is that this can really soak time away from a surgeon and being able to process through requests for procedures and so forth, and if they don't meet that criteria, you kind of get sucked in by the paper chase of going into appeals and so forth. Whereas if you have a more obvious approach that really shows the symptoms of the patient, that seems to enable you to be able to get more of a justification and quicker justification and approval. Is that is that the story? Let me take that one, Jim, um, and then you can sure. say the clinical part of it. But Milliman's an actuarial company, and they were um, contracted by the payers to try to um, determine um, the best match between uh, surgical um, procedure, you know, payments or authorizations with uh, it, who's most likely uh, um, cost benefit analysis, essentially, is what the initial goal was. And they developed a list of clinical and imaging and uh, adjunctive test criteria that say if you have these things, then you're, you know, it's more likely to be an effective procedure. And based on that, in the late 2000s, there were a lot, that was the basis for a lot of the either approvals or rejections of uh, surgical pre authorization. Initially, the criteria were not uh, released to the public and not well known. You just got the rejection. In the past few years, the, the criteria have become uh, more widely uh, accepted. And most of that it now is all done by uh, coding, uh, whether it be ICD-10 coding now or, uh, the, you know, the particular codes will allow the computer to suggest approval or disapproval. And then I'll, I'll uh, so it's important to make sure that you capture all of the findings, whether it's clinical or it's, whether it's radiology, uh, that you leverage your technology, the experience of your observers, and in particular, that all that translates into proper coding so that it uh, it will support the surgical uh, pre-authorization request. Jim, has that been kind of your, what's your, been your experience? Yes, uh, Doug, that's a, gr a great overview. And as you know, the, the Milliman or MCG guidelines that are called now, you know, they're guidelines for determination, most appropriate level of medical care. Um, you need to know the guidelines as a physician and a surgeon in particular submitting uh, uh, surgeries. Um, so with, you know, assuming that the physician uh, submitting the code uh, knows that the, the signs and symptoms are accurate and that they've demonstrated failure to improve with conservative care, the 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 reviewer is is going to put the majority of their weight on the accuracy or the interpretation of the radiographic interpretation uh, and essentially the summary. They're not going to go into the meat and bones of the of the um, the MRI or the CT scan, but mainly mainly the MRI for these purposes. And it has to reflect uh, accurate uh, compression. Uh, at levels that are demonstrated on the clinical notes. And if the two don't uh, jog, if you like, um, and you, that's the easiest way for them to deny it as not me medically necessary at the first level. So what we've seen over the years is in our MRI, we've demonstrated uh, more accurate uh, uh, demonstration of compression of nerve roots in the weight-bearing state uh, that hitherto was not seen, and that explained things a lot better for us. Uh, the report then was more accurate and it reflected it and it gave us a, a stronger uh, argument with the insurance companies. So overall, um, we, we were more successful in limiting our denials from the start. Um, and part of that was we actually submit an abbreviated uh, Millman's guideline uh, with the, uh, the criteria circled for that particular patient. And once that 
is sent to the reviewer in addition to the clinical notes and the MRI findings, and they all uh, tend to uh, mesh well together as they should uh, to get approved, uh, our denials have gone down considerably. And secondarily, when it gets to the appeal level and the second level, um, we found that we've had more demonstration uh, of strength again in, in combating the appeal uh, with the MRI and demonstrating uh, the pathology, whether it's foraminal stenosis or bulging disc that weren't seen before um, on other um, uh, other types of imaging, supine imaging. Um, and importantly, um, the radiologist interpretation has to jive with it. And I think the, the experienced radiologist who can uh, interpret what's really there and help us um, clinically uh, has been a win-win a over the last three years. So. So you find that, um, and it's a great discussion, and it sounds like it really opened up some some great, you know, next steps between you and Dr. Smith. You made a point here about uh, the radio. It's really important that you have a, a radiologist that knows how to read. It seems these spe special images from a vertical versus supine level for weight bearing. Um, how did how did that impact as you? You know, obviously, you said that you actually have a G-scan now on your location, a weight-bearing MRI. Introducing that and working with the radiologist, um, is it my understanding that you work with Dr. Smith to continue that down the road as sort of a business relationship and introducing that to your committee? Is that correct? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, we have a, a very uh, strong uh, working relationship with uh, Doug uh, and musculoskeletal uh, group that he's formed in addition to his uh, high level of uh, 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 radiographers and the, the readers. And um, they, they, they also request the clinical guidelines. They request the uh, uh, patient pain diagram. So essentially, they're, they're focused on looking at the MRI. It's not sort of... Um, blanket sort of target shooting. They're really look at, looking at for defined areas, uh, basically as the surgeon does. And that's what we do clinically, and we've done for years. And that's why our argument with the insurance company has always been, you know, hitherto we didn't put a whole lot as much weight on the radiologist's interpretation. We said, well, we're doing our own. This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking to see how that L5 nerve root is affected. Clinically, they have an M L5 nerve root uh, compression. They've supported EMG documentation of that. And is it getting caught from lateral recess stenosis and at the L4-5 level? Is it a, a far lateral disc at L5-S1 or foraminal closure? Um, and is that being demonstrated uh, appropriately by the, the, the MRI itself? And I believe this technology shows more uh, for sure. It's certainly 30 to 42 percent uh, higher if you look at the, um, the literature from UCLA and the Aberdeen group in, in Europe and uh, the SOTE group. And also, that's probably our interpretation here. But the radiology interpretation is key, and that working relationship is essential in making this whole technology uh, work. It's, it's a symphony, and when it works, it's, it's in collaboration. Uh, it, it's hard to beat, honestly. And it's been a, a revolutionary for our practice. It's been a, a massive advantage to our practice. And uh, it has reduced the frustrations in dealing with uh, denials and appeals uh, considerably over the years. Excellent, excellent. And um, on that note, a great transition as you were speaking specifically relative to the lumbar area. Uh, I've posted this video that I believe we have on mute right now for you to be able to talk the audience through on its value and specifics relative to the weight bearing MRI. I'll kick it off now. Uh, so this is a, a straightforward lumbar MRI. Um, <clears throat> a short segment is a few, uh, 30 seconds uh, out of 90 seconds of a clip demonstrating the weight-bearing capacity of the MRI with this animation. The patient's loading here, and we see the the redundant uh, ligamentum flavin uh, pushing in uh, dorsally to the the nerve root canal there. Uh, in addition to the central bulging disc. I mean, it's a dynamic component with the weight bearing. It's often uh, not one or the other. It's often a combined uh, process with the disc bulge, the facet hypertrophy, and ligament uh, compressing posteriorly, in addition to uh, demonstrating uh, the instability if, if uh, present as well. Uh, this is, these are some axial images uh, representing a dyna dynamic uh, positional changes 
uh, showing on the, the left the standard supine uh, view. And then when the patient's placed in a weight-bearing position at 78 degrees, um, the in, in, uh, ingress of the ligamentum hypertrophy in the spinal canal, which is quite remarkable. It's really hard to believe it until you see it. Uh, and you have to look at, you know, several years now at this stage, we've, we've collected uh, uh, examples of it, and it, it really has uh, made a believer uh, out of me in dem demonstrating it. But this has all been done years ago in, in positional and kin kin uh, kinetic MRI, um, basically in research labs 20 years ago when they were demonstrating the um, the the nature of flexion and extension. And we know clinically that's what that's that's what happens, uh, that the patients uh, get more symptoms when they extend, um, and they, they're relieved somewhat when they flex. Hey, Nancy, can this we just in on that previous? Sure. Just for a second, I'm just going to reinforce what Jim just said. I know this patient, and we had done a supine 1.5. The, uh, the image on the left is the supine uh, uh, G-scan. And the patient was referred to us because they had such dramatic symptoms and a pretty unimpressive MR. I mean, obviously, it's a disc bulge. But to Jim's point, it became much more critical stenosis. Well, and they were delighted to see what we had seen on standing lumbar uh, myelograms 30 years ago. This gives us the return of what we had known 30 years ago, but we, we just didn't have a test to reproduce without a needle. Sorry, I just wanted to add that, reinforce what you said. No, Jim. thanks, Doug. That's, that's great. I mean, the idea is to be interactive here. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, uh, Megan? So this just demonstrates a dynamic L4-5 listhesis and a positional uh, physiological stress. Again, going from 5 millimeters to 10 millimeters on, um, with listhesis. Um, this would be corroborated with other studies later, uh, dynamic uh, imaging, but the, the, the you know, study of choice is an MRI, and once you start demonstrating this, you can really see how the patients become so symptomatic uh, with this, and this is a, a very nice, clean representation of that. I'm going to show a quick video here as well. This is something that we weren't seeing before, and uh, standing myelograms didn't pick it up either. This is showing the uh, weight bearing, the disc herniation, and um, we're going to show a far lateral disc as well at L5S1. Uh, patients getting their supine uh, standard uh, MRI and then the supported uh, weight bearing MRI. And it just really shows the disc herniations uh, with the compressibility um, uh, from the, the patient's weight applied. Um, this is a standard supine. And then with the dynamic changes, we see increased lower doses uh, when you're standing, uh, and, and also the disc bulges uh, when they're weight-bearing. Um, the disc bulges uh, when they extend as well, and you're seeing the compression on the nerve root demonstrated on the right with the weight-bearing MRI uh, animation. And this is really a, a true re reflection on what we see in the MRI. Sorry, Doug. The, the, we're on the slide oh, now, so go ahead. To add to that, one of the things that uh, has been helpful is the dynamic part of disc herniations, as um, the natural history uh, of, of discs um, are to desiccate and dry out, become more fixed lesions with time. But the more acute lesions, especially post traumatic, uh, uh, go to acuity of these, the more flexible they are and the more dynamic portion, um, they're more likely to be acute injuries. I discovered some of that when I was working, I was working with the US ski team for a while where we knew exactly where the injury, uh, what time the injury was, because we saw it on TV and, the, and discovered that the ones that are more acute uh, tend to be more flexible. Um, has that been um, what's been your experience, Jim? Uh, you know what? Honestly, I I, I don't I haven't uh, seen that. I don't see enough probably acute discs at this stage. They all seem to go to, you know, pain management unless they got a foot drop, and that's getting a standard MRI acutely in the OR. <clears throat> you know, in the hospital setting and then to the OR. So I don't have experience, but I can well believe it. Yeah. So we did a lot with the athletes and the NBA and that kind of thing where we, we had baseline studies and then we'd get to see them after the injury. And, and uh, this, this kind of reinforces what the clinical experience is in the, in the sports community. Sorry. Wanted to add that piece. No, of it, not at all. Help. 
Nancy, can you go back one more? This is Jim going to talk about a lateral disc herniation. And I'll give it back so, to you, Jim. So, um, yeah. There you go. Thank you. I'm sorry. Did you want to go Next forward back, or back? Back, back one, please. Certainly. They're both so the same thing. So this is a dynamic L5 S1 disc herniation showing the uh, L5 radiculopathy and um, and a standard MRI. Um, you, you're going to miss this. You're, you're going to look for foraminal stenosis and it's not there. And this is a clear demonstration of that lateral, um, far lateral disc herniation seen with the weight bearing uh, compressing the exiting L5 nerve root. And we see these um, time and time again uh, that are not picked up in standard MRI. So this has really changed. Uh, the accuracy of our diagnosis, number one, resulting in better treatment, a, a targeted treatment with selective nerve root blocks, and obviously better treatment, better diagnosis, better outcomes, uh, better relationships with the insurance companies, um, the uh, your referral uh, groups, and obviously your patients are happier. So uh, we can move to the next slide, which demonstrates it other, otherwise as well. One, um, could I add one? Yeah, ahead. well, same thing. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah. No, go ahead. You can finish that off. This throws the far lateral just there on weight bearing. Yeah, exactly. These are scout images, so the chronos are somewhat grainy. But we, what you'll see is that uh, the left image uh, is uh, supine, and there's really no uh, the 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 dark is the disc going out laterally, uh, compressing the extra foraminal root. And in the center are the supine image, and the then the weight bearing image below. And the disc herniation is dynamic and compresses that extra foraminal nerve root. And I don't know about you, Jim, but I, I went through probably 25 of my 30 years without having seen these often because I didn't have the right test to look for it. When we did myelograms, it's outside of the dural root sleeve, so you wouldn't see it. When I did discography, I'm either shooting from the front or the side, and at that angle, it's covered by the bone and you wouldn't see it. You just would inject the disc and they would, you know, it would reproduce their radiculopathy. But I, when I started doing these weight bearing images, I started seeing this case. And the one we showed a minute ago was one of our first cases with a patient spine surgeon there and said, we've been, we've been chasing this thing for two years. It's a solid L5 radiculopathy, but we can't find why it's there. We stood him up and that's what we saw. Sorry. Good clinical story. Uh, I, I I agree. So I'd like to just quickly say the the animations are going to be attached. Uh, these were abbreviated animations. They're all about 90 seconds clips, and they'll be at the end of the uh, webinar for anybody who wants to look at them in detail later. Uh, we produced them re uh, locally in Reno with lure animations in conjunction with Doug Smith. So we both have our various copies on our websites, but they'll be included in the webinar. And they really demonstrate that. The, um, the pathology and the uh, the points that were made. Thank you. We'll, un we'll ensure the links go out to the audience members. Uh, that Thanks for making that touch. Perfect. So now we're at a stage, great conversation, gentlemen, when we're looking at the outcomes. How did this really impact from a surgical perspective, from a radiological perspective, and from a healthcare perspective along uh, the impact within your business? So just a few questions here. You know, when we're looking at the, how this weight-bearing technology has really impacted uh, the guidelines, I think we discussed this earlier um, and touched on it. Maybe we can just give a, a, a quick summary point, and then we're going to proceed into, you know, how the impact of the patient, you know, the procedures and so forth from a surgical perspective. I'm sure Dr. Lynch has a huge insight into that. So did you want to kick off on a summary relative to the Middleman guidelines, or would you like to go ahead and speak to uh, really the impact to the patient and the procedures? Uh, Doug, you take the uh, guidelines. Uh, you're actually more truly uh, an expert on that than I, I ever will be, and then I'll take the clinical. So, I, Yeah, sounds great. Uh, and I, I think what uh, the G-Scanner, along with uh, comparison of the findings, the dynamic uh, mechanical post portion of the um, unique study combined with the clinical part with uh, pain diagrams allows us to take the um, anatomic findings that we see on MR with the pain diagrams that reflect the effect on the neural structures and uh, combine those to the ICD-10 coding, which is um, which helps uh, Dr. Lynch or Jim uh, 
uh, put it together with what he sees clinically and help support uh, his surgical recommendations um, uh, to the patient. And I, I see my role is helping to uh, Jim to uh, get the right procedure for the right patient at the right time without uh, being obstructed by, uh, you know, poor coding or, or other things on our end that, that might um, conflict with what he sees with the patient. So our, ours is a supportive role to try to get the right uh, coding and information to support uh, a, a Jim's impression. Thank you. Thanks. And on the on the patient and clinical side, Dr. Lynch, and uh, we've got about ten minutes to work through a couple of a couple okay. of other key questions, and then we're going to open to Q and A, audience. Great. Thank you. We could just advance the slide one for the audience, please. Thank you. Um, and we'll just uh, one more, please. There you go. Um, overall, th this is a re really, for me, a new frontier in imaging technology. Uh, it's redefining imaging of the spinal motion and, uh, and its direct impact on nerves. Um, I view standard traditional MRIs that we've seen for the last 20 years as really uh, a method for uh, demonstrating the composition of the spine. And I look at this new technology in weight bearing as demonstrating the function of the spine. And, and, and as a surgeon who, who wants to understand how complex uh, a series of joints the spine is, this is the technology that's gonna give us that, to see that. Um, it's, it's akin to looking at um, a gait analysis uh, to understand how a knee or a, 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 a hip works uh, in the, in the uh, uh, phys physiology labs of, of orthopedic practices to understand that. And that gives us more insight than before. We just had one static look at things. And we, we, we combined it then with other technologies such as, you know, outdated flexion extension x-rays been around for 70 years. But, you know, they have issues that they, they're not lined up well, that the patients are in spasm and they're rotated, and they're not giving us accurate uh, imaging. They're sort of a, just a, a guess. And, and I can tell you if the surgeon's guessing, um, the radiologist is guessing even more because they don't have the, demo, the, the, the benefit of having the patient um, information there in front of them at times. So this has really changed our whole overall experience. Um, we can offer the patient an MRI imaging technology in our office. Uh, it's less out-of-pocket cost for the patient, less cost to the payer as well. As, which has been our experience. Um, it's an open uh, MRI, as we've well demonstrated. Patients have the uh, the procedure in a comfortable uh, environment, which is really a pleasant imaging experience for them uh, without sacrificing quality, which is the key in anything. You have this technology, and I think the technology uh, has caught up with the uh, the, the, the promise of 20 years ago of, of, of what people wanted to see, and now that the new technology has been able to give us the imaging uh, with, uh, w without sacrificing quality. Um, the, uh, the, oftentimes the patients, as we said, have pain when they stand up. Patients don't have pain when they lay down generally. It's relieved by that, and we ask them that, and uh, we often have the patients reproduce their pain, uh, sort of like a, uh, like a discogram. It's a, it's a provocative test. Well, this MRI is often a provocative test as well, uh, allowing patients to sort of um, be in the weight-bearing position and demonstrate, you know, I'm getting the pain now, and, you know, I was looking at correlation MRIs at the same time. The corollary of that are, uh, is that oftentimes patients are, are too painful to lay down uh, supine an MRI. So we often start them standing up or um, they only get their MRI standing up if they're really critically stenosed and they're too uncomfortable to lay down or if they have too much spasm, uh, they can still have an excellent MRI uh, in, in a weight-bearing capacity. And, and that doesn't happen too often, but certainly in those patients, um, those patients would uh, abandon the MRI elsewhere and have to go for a general anesthetic, which again, more risk, more cost to the to the insurance companies. Um, it's definitely more accurate diagnosis uh, of instability for us. Uh, we capture the better uh, better capture of disc herniations with the weight bearing. Uh, we see that increased lordosis. Uh, we also see uh, facet joint cysts uh, compressing the fecal sac, uh, causing stenosis more in evidence, and uh, facet joints themselves causing much more foraminal closures are, are really demonstrated more. And uh, when you see that, you can really target your uh, uh, interventional pain procedures uh, to that level with a, a higher degree of uh, accuracy. Again, better outcomes. 
Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And this question is really open to, to both of you all for a great discussion. So what are some of your uh, lessons you've shared in the transition and the traditional approach to MRI and moving into the weight-bearing MRI approach? And uh, Dr. Smith, let's start with you, and then we can work on the clinical side as well. I think, uh, I think part of that um, relates to educating the industry and the community about the differences. It's actually, in, in my experience, easier um, to uh, talk to folks from the old days of weight-bearing myelography. Folks like Jim and I have been around a few years, and when we did myelograms at weight-bearing, we, we just, in um, our experience and our training, reflected uh, the mechanical uh, parts of, of spinal imaging and spinal surgery. And... Uh, there was probably 20 years or so where supine images were pretty standard. And I think a lot of people forgot the dynamic uh, three-dimensional parts of, uh, you know, spinal anatomy and physiology. And uh, a lot of it's re-educating uh, people to think uh, dynamically about the spine. Now, every patient can tell you it's a dynamic structure. When they stand up or when they're leaning on a shopping cart, leaning forward to increase their canal di dimension, they know it's mechanical. But sometimes when it gets to the coding piece and uh, gets to, uh, people have to be re-educated about why, why we do this. And we're really trying to show why people have symptoms when they're uh, you know, upright and doing uh, activities of daily living because they can't live in bed. And the other part I wanted to add was it, this is a um, art form, if you will, if you're a technologist. We're intentionally putting somebody in a position that reproduces their symptoms. So there's an art of a technologist to gain trust and, uh, and reassure the patient that we know that they're hurting, that we're putting them in a position to try to see why that is. And it's, um, it's different than just putting them on a 1-5 scanner pushing, you know, record and uh, taking the images, a really great scan requires a really experienced and patient technologist. And on the radiologist side, it's, we're looking for what are the differences between the two? What is the dynamic portion that explains why they get pain relief when they're laying down? Which really reinforces what, uh, what, what Jim was saying. And once the insurance providers understand that, that that's an efficient way to determine uh, what, need, what you know, what Jim needs to be doing, then you know that keeps surgeons in the OR rather than uh, doing um, appeals for preauthorization rejections. Is that fair, Jim? Absolutely. Uh, no, I agree wholeheartedly um, w with that. I think the key for everybody and uh, is assess your needs. Uh, look at your your practice. Um, how this can benefit by learning the technology. Number one. Then collaborate with an experienced company, uh, with uh, whether it's uh, a Sote or another uh, company. But the radiology team is very important. And I, I specifically uh, didn't contract with one of my local radiologist groups in Reno uh, because they didn't have this background knowledge. Phenomenal radiologists do a great job everywhere else. But uh, I didn't want them to have to learn this technology. They wouldn't be on our MRI. And I wanted somebody who uses this every day in their practice and understands the uh, physiology and the clinical aspects of it. And that's why I engaged uh, in teleradiology with Doug, who's in San Antonio and we're in Reno, and it's worked out perfectly. We can communicate by web, email, text uh, on patients, and um, it's really given us a better um, result and a better product at the end of the day uh, by doing that. Excellent, excellent. And thanks to both of you for the insight on those questions. This interview has been fabulous. Um, I'm going to move quickly into Q&A because we have three or four questions queued up by the audience. I have a quick summary here that will be contained within the PowerPoint they'll be sending out and in the webinar. So I'm going to scoot right over to Q&A. Okay, Megan, did you want to go ahead and offer a question from the audience? Yes, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. We'll now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into our control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We'll try to get through as many questions as we have time for. 
So to kick it off here, one audience member would like to know, when the MRI, MRIs are performed with the G-Scan machine, do you automatically perform the supine and then the standing, or when ordered, do you just perform the standing? As well as, can bariatric patients fit in this machine, and do claustrophobic patients fare better in this machine? So, if you'd like to we, take that. <laughs> sure, sure. They, well, we, we routinely do both the supine and upright uh, exam when we can, and the reason for that is to look for dynamic symptoms. As to which one we provide, we perform first, really depends on the patient. If they're somewhat claustrophobic or they're somewhat uncomfortable, we may start with them laying down so it's uh, it's more secure for them. If they're really uncomfortable standing up, if they've got you know positional. Uh, symptoms that are severe, we'll start with them upright and get those uh, images before they fatigue and then lay them down. But I think it's really important to have both sets of images so you can, one, determine if they're, uh, if if you saw the disc herniation standing up, you still don't know whether it's dynamic and you don't know, uh, you know, you get more information from doing both. Does that make sense? And oh, bariatric patients. So the the, the trade off for having great signal at lower field strength is you've got to have the antenna or the receiver coil very near the patient. So it's not a great uh, choice for a, a bariatric patient, a, a large uh, girth uh, patient. But uh, but folks do well with the claustrophobia side because as you saw, the the uh, side of the scanner is open. Our experience with claustrophobia relates a lot to their um, uh, interaction with the technologist. If they spend some time up front building a relationship, and in the scanner uh, shell is called a pavilion, and it has a, they can talk easily, you can hear the patient breathing, so it's a very um, personal experience, and that really relates to the claustrophobia as opposed to being in a, you know, kind of soundproof room with this, you know, uh, that's what gets people spooky. Good help Great. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for clarifying that. The next question is, what is the percentage of examinations where you saw changes in weight-bearing versus supine? I I can answer that, I think. So sure, sure. I probably read, um, we're getting pretty, 10,000 uh, MRs. I've read probably 300,000 in my career. And um, the UCLA study showed about 30% of the time you saw uh, findings that were either only seen on weight bearing or more significant on weight bearing than supine. And I think that your your rate of differences depends on your patient population. But I think the 30 to 40% is a, a good number. For that, if you're doing uh, acute trauma like uh, motor vehicle incidents, then you may see more acute disc herniations or sports injuries, things like that. Like USD team, we saw those kinds of findings. If you're dealing in, uh, you know, older patients, Medicare patients, you see more mechanical um, facet joint slippage, lysthesis, and dynamic central stenosis, and and uh, Jim. You know, Jim has a fair amount of experience with that. Let me pass that to him. Absolutely, I would concur. Well, I don't have, I haven't done a study on it. Um, we've we've seen a lot more uh, demonstration of uh, pathology with increased ligamentum buckling uh, in the lumbar, the disc bulging, uh, and the foraminal um, uh, motion and picking up spondylolisthesis better than we would have before as a guide. Uh, also, the um, the disc uh, central bulge you've seen in the uh, cervical that we didn't explain very well before is, is really very impressive when the patient's flexing flexing on, on weight bearing and uh, seeing the the compression, which really helps us in identifying patients at risk for with myelopathy. Um, the other part of it is we've seen patients with ligamentous buckling posteriorly in the cervical that actually stretches out on flexion and it's opened up and then on extension, uh, we've seen it in buckling and be more more pronounced, to, uh, which is really reassuring that we know and it might change whether we go posteriorly or anteriorly as well. 
Well, that's a really good point, Jim. On uh, when you see uh, dorsal dynamic dorsal cord compression from that posterior ligament, does it um, present itself dif differently with uh, dorsal column symptoms versus you know anterior kind of anterior cord symptoms? Have you seen any? If, if it's more severe, yeah. I mean, both inter you know, both form com can. can cause either radiculopathy or myelopathy on their own rights. But um, w when we get that in com combination with anterior compression and it's a pincer effect, you're certainly more liable to have myel myelopathy and, and be symptomatic, I think, with more gait disturbance with posterior compression than just anterior alone, honestly, because your dorsal columns are affected. So I think I don't have a study on it, but that's my, my overall sense that uh, when you're squeezed front and back, uh, you're going to have more leg issues. Great, thank you both for those informative responses. The next audience member asks, can we use the dynamic MRI beyond the spine pathology like regional MSK MRI? Uh, yeah. Doug, you're probably the, best on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. The answer is yes. And I got particularly interested in, um, for a period of my career, I was taking care of international ballerinas, and they have functional uh, deformities when they're on point. And uh, most of our foot and ankle surgeons take their x-rays weight-bearing because many of the deformities are um, dynamic uh, and functional. And w uh, the G-Scanner has the capability of doing weight-bearing foot and ankle. And that could be a real exciting uh, area of demonstrating abnormalities that you, you, know, you won't see in uh, conventional uh, supine or non-weight bearing images. We also see um, some dynamic issues as they relate to uh, uh, hips can be done weight bearing. Anything in the lower extremity can be done weight bearing. So you'll see uh, uh, in the uh, orthopedic knee community, there's a concept of a ramp lesion, R-A-M-P, which is injury of the meniscus attachment to the posterior capsule. When you stand up, the meniscus sublux. And that's always been a hard one for us to see. But with dynamic weight bearing, it, you can easily see uh, that dynamic, you know, things that arthroscopists have seen for years. I, in particular, I would give uh, great credit to uh, Asote for developing hand and wrist coils that uh, the imaging of the elbow and the uh, imaging of the wrist are really quite remarkable, which goes to the engineering of their receiver coils. So the answer is yes, and a, you know, an enthusiastic yes. Great. Thank you so much. That's helpful to understand. The next audience member would like to know if you could compare this technology to the weight-bearing orthokinematics vertebral motion analysis, if you're familiar with that technology and its relative diagnostic value. Wow, <laughs> that's that's, uh, that, that's one for me. Um, we uh, it's Spine Nevada. We're, we're we've opened. I actually kind of like that Remington guy. I bought the company thing. Um, I, I believe in the technology so much of the weight bearing. We're opening our second uh, Sote weight bearing MRI this month in two weeks time. And in conjunction with that, we have three vertebral motion analysis uh, machines, orthokinematics. And this is part of our whole push towards understanding the function of the spine. And you'll see on the, the videos, the animations that it's, uh, I've called it our in-motion MRI as opposed to just weight bearing. And we're kind of looking at the overall function. And we've used that to, to kind of tie into the rest of our company uh, with in-motion uh, technology, uh, in-motion physical therapy. But our orthokinematics has been revolutionary as well. And using the two com com combination, demonstrating uh, patients uh, showing on the lumbar alone, uh, higher degrees of spondylolisthesis and slippage when you eliminate their ability to uh, splint and uh, when they're in pain, they splint and they don't move, um, where you remove that when you use this um, vertebral motion analysis. We also flex the, uh, and extend the patient in one plane, so it eliminates that um, inter-observer view um, where they can't see, particularly scoliosis or somebody's moving, um, they can't demonstrate the back of the vertebral bodies very accurately with consistency because the patient moves in a different position and it's trying to do a 3D uh, reading and they're just guessing it at the end of the day. So this is pure and accurate and it's an objective measure. That in correlation with the, M the MRI has really, I mean, the
two of them have have resulted in not near to zero, but close as uh, zero denials from the insurance companies. Once we do our part educationally and submit the, the correct patient, our, our imaging is, is hard to argue with. So it's been a great benefit to merge the two technologies. Great, thank you for clarifying that. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Could either of you clarify what the room size requirements are in voltages? That's Doug. Oh, uh, on voltage. Uh, good question. So there's two components of it. Um, there's 220 and 110 for different components of it. Um, I think the the big part in your project planning is to uh, make sure that uh, assure that you don't have interference on the radio frequency or the um, electronic part with the imaging. Um, and I, you know, it's helpful to get that vantage point on the practice as a whole, so that the practice fits well into the environment, but also so the environment doesn't adversely affect uh, the MRI from a engineering standpoint. Thank you. That's very helpful. That is all the time we have for today. I want to thank Asote for their excellent presentation and to our audience for participating today. Enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thank Thanks, you. Megan. Thanks all.